Thank you all very much for being here this afternoon. I'm Betsy Nabel, proud president of Brigham and Women's Hospital. And on, ha on behalf of the Brigham, as we say, uh, I want to extend a very, very warm welcome uh, to all of you. Uh, we have been planning uh, this session perhaps for 100 years. <laughs> this year, we're, we are very proud to celebrate the centennial of Brigham and Women's Hospital. It is the centennial of the Harvard School of Public Health. And Jeff, uh, the medical school has been here uh, much longer. Uh, but this session really came out of the partnership, the wonderful partnership uh, that we at the Brigham have the good fortune of having uh, with uh, the School of Public Health uh, and the medical school. And I want to acknowledge and thank my amazing colleagues and friends, Julio Frank and Jeff Flyer, uh, for what we have the privilege to do together day in and day out on behalf of this amazing medical community uh, here. I want to gratefully acknowledge President Drew Faust and Provost Alan Garber, who have been extraordinarily supportive of our efforts in global health and who uh, unfortunately could not uh, join us uh, today. We have uh, three other leaders who are uh, with us today who have been uh, staunch uh, supporters of our global health efforts. And I, I'm simply going to acknowledge them as I look to my left and move over to my right. The first is Dr. Mike Zinner, who is our chief of surgery uh, at the Brigham. Uh, you have heard references to Mike, but Mike is one of those inspired leaders. Uh, who gets things going and then stands in the background and is very quiet and humble and takes no credit. But let me tell you, he, he's making it all happen. And thank you very much, Mike. I next... Uh, I want to next uh, thank my predecessor at the Brigham and now our chief of partners healthcare, Dr. Gary Gottlieb, who has been so instrumental uh, in supporting the efforts at the Brigham and across uh, Harvard University in global health uh, for a number of years. He made it very easy for me when I came to the Brigham because he literally set the stage for me to step uh, into. Gary, thank you very much for your leadership. And finally, I want to thank Dr. Larry Schulman, who um, has been referenced uh, with respect to our cancer partnership uh, in Butero. I think uh, uh, Larry single-handedly is responsible for, for building uh, the first cancer hospital uh, in the country of Rwanda, but establishing a program in cancer care uh, which will serve for as a model, not only throughout Rwanda, but uh, throughout the developing world. Thank you, Larry. We could not do what we've done without your leadership. <laughs> There's been several themes that have emerged uh, today. Uh, we've talked about our uh, being a real partnership uh, in a global setting, and you've heard about our partnership between uh, the Brigham the School of Public Health uh, and um, the medical school. But I think fundamentally that partnership is, is characterized by several uh, phrases. And I'm hoping as we go through our conversation over the next hour, you will hear these concepts uh, brought uh, to life. Innovation and discovery is at the heart of what we do across our, our three institutions. It's the fabric of who we are, uh, and it's what makes us such an intellectually rich, uh, but uh, also such a strong implementer uh, in our, our commitments. We are a learning laboratory. We're a learning laboratory here in the Longwood Medical Area, uh, and we take that learning laboratory to every site uh, in the world in which we touch, whether it be here uh, in Boston or around the world. We have a tremendous sense of interdependence. We have an interdependency amongst ourselves here in our immediate institutions, and we rely on one another uh, to be good citizens as we are effectors uh, across the global setting. Uh, and finally, uh, at the end of the day, what makes this all work is partnerships, and it's relationship, uh, and it's 
one human touching another that really uh, sustains us and allows us uh, to bring about our important work. And I think these are themes uh, that you are going to hear much more about. Uh, and then finally, is Howard Hyatt still with us? Hello. Howard, where are you? Where are you? Do I see him? He was here. Before uh, I, I move on, I want to also gratefully acknowledge Dr. Howard Hyatt, who has been behind the scenes in getting so much started, uh, and even in his absence, because I know he will hear us. I want to thank Howard Hyatt as well. Uh, and now it's, it's my uh, pleasure to um, turn over to our final panel. Uh, our topic is to alleviate human suffering, our work to strengthen global health care. And we're so very fortunate to have, have Robin Young uh, this afternoon as our uh, moderator. Uh, Robin was the unanimous uh, first choice of our illustrious panel. Uh, as soon as you hear her, you will recognize Robin. She is an uh, Emmy award-winning broadcaster who has reported for NBC, CBS, and ABC television, but you all know her as the current co-host of Here and Now on WBUR and NPR, and she is we are absolutely delighted, Robin, that you agreed to join us. I'm introducing Robin, and Robin, in turn, uh, will uh, take over and moderate and introduce our panelists. Thank you so much, Robin, for Thank being you. with us. Thank you so much, Betsy. Thank you. Well, um, I am sitting here with the most extraordinarily capable people in the universe. Um, and in fact, I, they don't even need me. They have decided they could go out and run the lunch truck and then do all the road work and come back and still do this panel. Um, so capable, and they have decided to introduce themselves uh, to see how much they really know and understand each other. So I know you've choreographed this. Take it away. Let me go in first, if that's all right, because I think <laughs> of this guy as the grandfather of the work we're doing. So we wait, wait, is that a compliment? <laughs> <laughs> is that great-grandfather? <laughs> That'll do fine. This My is children, <laughs> how beautiful they are. It's like a new Fox special, when global health workers fight. Right. <laughs> a new tabloid show. So we're not only introducing ourselves, we're introducing each other. Because what I realize is that you never get to tell the full story of some of the folks who are here. Uh, and getting the chance to explain how Paul has been someone who has influenced me, Noel, uh, and a lot of people I see out here in this audience. Um, he is a person who, during medical school, many of you know, Helped start, part, helped start Partners in Health in his spare time, going to Haiti, setting up a clinic, making it work there. But there was a fundamental drive underneath this that was something that I took away as someone who got to uh, run into Paul uh, on our own rotations as residents. That was after you helped Hillary Clinton. <laughs> During medical school. That's my let's, 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 sorry, let's, sorry. let's focus on Paul. All right, all right. Let's focus on Paul here. So during uh, this time, 11 o'clock at night, there would be surgeons running around and Paul. And Paul would be there and he'd be happy to talk about your patient and your ambitions and your desires and how, number one, you were going to make a difference in the world. And here was the essence of what I felt like I took away from you and what the message you sent in your actions and the work and what you built. And that was that the poor are the stress test for the healthcare system, wherever they are. That the care of the poor define what we are capable of as a society as a whole. That if we are taking good care of the poor, then we know we're taking good care of everybody up and down the system. And what made that powerful and a Harvard message, which is the surprising thing, right? So what's he doing here? <laughs> the answer was that they were, he was leading a group of people who did discovery. And there were three discoveries that influenced me um, that were really foundational, but there have been many discoveries that have continued on from the work that Paul has led. One was in tuberculosis and showing that uh, multi-drug resistant, well, first of all, that tuberculosis could be treated in the real world, in the poor world, and be successfully brought under control. And then second, that you could deal with multi-drug resistant tuberculosis, and that the way to do it was not to innovate about the way you made the drug, 
It was to be innovative about the way that you made sure people got the drug. And he created, he helped create what became DOTS, um, directly observed therapy, comma, short course. <laughs> and the second thing that he helped demonstrate that I remember at this time was that there was enormous skepticism that HIV could be ever treated in the poor parts of the world. That we had antiretroviral therapies and then demonstrated that um, while Congress was holding hearings at which people were testifying that the poor could not take HIV drugs because they didn't have watches and therefore couldn't keep track of time for taking their medications and that this problem and that problem were in the way. Meanwhile, he just went to Haiti and he made it happen. And he showed exactly how it could be done. And time and again, he's been the beacon on that hill who's shown us those capabilities. So that third component was the creation of community health workers to make all of these things possible. And many of the concepts of community health workers have now come back to be the way that we take care of people across Boston, the poor, the, um, and, and lots of people who are simply sick and need more um, successful care. So the introduction to Paul is here's a person who showed us the rest of the way at the Brigham, at Harvard Medical School, Harvard School of Public Health, at all the hospitals around here about how you make a career in discovery while um, uh, showing the way to take care of the poor. And uh, for that, uh, it's a great chance to be on the panel with you, Paul. Thank you. Um, I would like to add that also, knowing Paul, he will always take the time to speak to anybody, um, and I, whether you're a medical student or somebody that's interested in medicine. Um, and it's amazing for somebody so who's so... So go talk so, to him. Mm -hmm. Right. No, so for somebody who's so busy, he has the time, and he always makes the time, which I, just shows his generosity. Um, but my, my job is actually to introduce a tool here. And Atul and I um, went to medical school together, and indeed, he did go and help Hillary Clinton for a year. Um, and I didn't know him at the time, but we knew of him, and we always were very excited to hear what he had to say. Um, but we also knew that Atul would be doing these amazing things from way back when. Um, he is the professor, a professor at Harvard Medical School um, in the Department of Surgery. He's a professor um, at the School of Public Health, um, and he's also the director of um, Adrian a Ariadne, a Ariadne um, which the, deals with the, the health, pronunciation we have to work on. <laughs> health systems innovation. Um, but I think that what one really needs to understand about a tool is just how he is so amazing at bringing everything together. He has this unbelievable ability to write. And if, none of, if somebody has not read his work, uh, please do. He's written three um, bestseller books um, and has written um, in The New Yorker. But if you read any of his articles, they will educate you, they will enlighten you, and more importantly, I think they will move you. Um, and there have been times where I've read um, one of his uh, articles about when it's time to give up. When should a patient and her family decide it's time to let go? Um, and what does that mean for that person? What does that mean for the um, physicians who are taking care of her? What does that mean for the family? And what does that mean for the institution itself? Um, other groundbreaking um, works are, uh, for instance, slow ideas. Um, what is it about good ideas, and why does it take so long for us to move forward? Um, I, if you haven't had a chance to hear him on Colbert, um, I would recommend that as well, because it's been amazing to listen to him, and Col Colbert gave him a hard time for having his article be so long in title. Um, and if it's slow ideas, why didn't he just come up with something quicker? Uh, <laughs> um, but I think also the other part of a tool that uh, you do learn when you're reading about him is that he is a father and a husband. Um, so beyond the amazing things, he is able to maintain a really wonderful family. Um, and it's a pleasure to know you, Atul. <laughs> so, <clears throat> so I get the burdensome task of inter introducing <laughs> Nawal. Um, but first, I have to say something about Atul. <laughs> and that was when he was... This isn't part of the deal. Yeah, I know, but you already violated our uh, trust, our sacred trust. And you know, Grandpa may be old, but he remembers. <laughs> um, 
was that uh, e even when, when Atul was an intern and a, a, a junior resident in surgery, um, you'd see his notes, and I'd look at them and think, boy, he sure writes pretty. <laughs> <laughs> so even back then. Um, so Noel, I, I, I hate to embarrass you, but it's been 23 years since we met. And you could say, wow, she's pretty well preserved. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, she came to Harvard Medical School 23 years ago um, and was a research assistant for a friend of mine, the late Jonathan Mann mm -hmm. and Daniel Tarantola. And since then, which is a, you know, um, I think all three of us really were lucky enough to, to go to medical school uh, where we were encouraged to embrace uh, issues of interest to us, and we've been able to pursue them for our lo entire lives afterwards at the Brigham and continuing at HMS and, and Harvard School of Public Health. For Noel, um, that interest 23 years ago in health and human rights has, it seems to me, guided her entire career uh, since then. She's never really wavered, even though to an outsider you'd say, well, wait, she went off and did obstetrics and gynecology. You'd say, oh, she did obstetrics and gynecology. Um, all the things that she talked about it as a student, even at Brown, where I didn't know her, and later at Harvard. Um, she, by the time she got here, by the way, she had, I was thinking this morning on my way here, uh, on a plane, of course, that her CV was longer than a tapeworm. <laughs> that was the only <laughs> image I could come up with. Lovely. <laughs> that was when she was, infectious disease humor really doesn't go over too well. <laughs> Surgical humor is worse. <laughs> so I, I wanted to think about three things that were remarkable, um, because you can read uh, her CV. And, uh, and seeing her as a student, as a teacher, as a clinician, um, it, it, wasn't, it wasn't difficult to find many things on that list. Um, and I'm not going to talk about, uh, let's say, the fact that she was born in Khartoum. Uh, or that she won a MacArthur Genius Award, or that she is famous inside health and human rights circles for her work on uh, female genital cutting, or even that she started at the Brigham. And I think this gives you an idea both about Nawal and about the Brigham. She started at the Brigham, uh, the African Women's Health Center. And again, I think that says something really about both the person uh, this was in 1999, or it was quite some time ago, really at just at the end of her, still during her training. It says something about the person to think that globally, uh, but also uh, about the institution, about her training program and, and friends. So one, here's the three things, um, is that she has a remarkable ability to link uh, an understanding of the very fine-grained local, the problem that a patient sitting right before her might have, or uh, on an operating table uh, might have, but also to link that to the large scale, an understanding of the world, how it works, how history, political economy, gender, inequal gender inequality, uh, how culture, how all these come together to put some women at risk and girls at risk of very poor outcomes. Um, and she's made a, uh, a life study, a, of studying and, and writing about these poor outcomes, but also how others are spared. So that understanding of the large scale and the local is quite unusual, uh, I, I fear, in, in modern medicine. And you know, when you hear someone say, oh, she gets lost in the weeds, we want doctors to get lost in the weeds, the weeds of our own personal, if we're a patient, we want them to take care of every detail and think about the problem before us. But isn't it great when a doctor can also uh, think about these large-scale forces that are difficult to see, much less to understand. Two, second point, um, and that is that when you have this combination of someone who is a critical thinker and also an excellent writer, I mean, come on, there's only one a tool, but a great writer, a great researcher, a scholarly person who understands how to talk about difficult subjects, like the ones I just mentioned, Female genital cutting, cutting is, is a paradigmatic example of a, a real problem uh, uh, that is 
uh, as is cruelty and gender inequality and how they might come together, but be able to talk and think about these problems and also be humane and loving and kind uh, and, and, and civil even in any difficult debates. That is another rare and welcome trait. Uh, and three, uh, and I think this is something that, again, I'm thrilled to be on tap to talk to any young people here today. Uh, but I've also seen and learned, as all of us have, that Nawal is a fantastic and generous teacher and mentor. And those are three things that I'd like you to remember about her. Thank you. Well, and I'd like to start with Nawal, Dr. Noor. Um, uh, because I, I, what I've been enjoying this afternoon is hearing how people were inspired. And we've already heard a little of how you two were inspired by Grandpa down there. Um, <laughs> but, uh, I, you know, again, when I first read the 2000 New York Times article about your center, I mean, here's the, here are the first words of this New York Times article. In all the vast territory of American public health, there is nothing like the African women's health practice at the Brigham. And then they went on to describe what you do and how stunning this was. And um, for, for many of us, it was just as eye-opening. You're kidding. You know, we hadn't really understood uh, female circumcision at all or you know, parts of the vagina removed or, or sewed up completely so that there's this small opening. I mean, it was just, just stunning. Um, and then to, to learn that uh, your dad is Sudanese and was against this. Am I reaching? Was he an inspiration for you? Yeah, I, it was a combination. My mother's American, um, and my father is um, grew up in the British Empire and was uh, educated by the British in, in Sudan and then went overseas um, to England to do his PhD. Um, and it was around uh, that time where my father actually came back to the Sudan and um, started voicing and at being an activist um, against female circumcision, female genital mutilation, female genital cutting, all these different terminologies that different groups use. Um, and he stood up against it and said, I don't think this is something that as Sudanese we should perpetuate and do on our girls or women, and this is something that we should let go, leave behind. And um, women actually pulled him aside and said, what are you doing? And this is a women's issue, back off. And Explain it was- that because you say it's a woman's thing. It's very much, a, a, so it's an interesting dynamic. Um, so you have women who are managing this practice and tradition, who are controlling how the next generation gets cut. And yet there's of course the nuances above all of this of how men play a role or don't play a role. So there is a passivity that men have where they're just like, this is a women's issue, we're not going to get involved. Yet when you have men who want to get involved to stop it, women are the ones that say back off. So it's this very, very difficult structure. And when you talk about social change or trying to bring about system change, how do you change a system when there's so many um, forces that are moving forward to perpetuate a practice that's so complex. Can you just explain a little more of that? Um, because women who are coming to you, many of them want some sort of reconstruction. They want help. I mean, I, you, it, it's hard to imagine how they are getting pregnant, for instance, or and many having difficulty going to the bathroom. But on the other hand, one of the things you want doctors around the world to know is, and doctors here in the United States, if, if these patients increasingly are walking into their offices because we have you know, immigrant populations, you can't act repulsed by this because there are women who might not understand that. They love their bodies right. and they don't. So it gets so complicated. I'm a, aren't there women coming to you saying, look what happened to me? And why aren't they then the ones also trying to stop it? So it depends on a woman's self-identity. So some women will feel that this is something that happened to them, it happened to their sister, their aunt, their mother, and it was a tradition, a rite of passage that they may even feel proud of, you know, that they've been a part of this group, they've uh, belonged to this group, and don't feel um, that they've been mutilated. So you'll have patients who'll say, why are you calling it mutilation? I was never mutilated. This is something that I am proud of. Those patients, um, I find, have very little post-traumatic stress disorder. They are actually very much embracing this tradition. Um, but yet, they may need some reconstruction because 
they're having long-term complications from this practice um, and need a what we call a defibrillation or a reconstruction of the external genitalia. Then you'll have a patient who'll come in and she's um, felt very abandoned by her culture and very much uh, betrayed by her parents. So why did her mom abduct her? Why did her mom do this to her? And so there is a sense of mutilation, that something horrible happened to her as a child. Um, I find with the majority of my patients, they, f they fit in the former, not the latter. Um, and yet, all of them need some sort of reconstruction of some sort, um, especially the ones who've undergone the type 3. Um, and then you did make mention the sort of how do I, I, I do, I take care of the patients and what their issues, but I also want to take care of the health providers who've never seen this and how to walk them through a process of giving cultural competent care to understand the, the history that comes um, with female genital mutilation and get, help them understand that when a patient comes to their practice, not to show that shocked look, not to um, even wince when they're examining because we always talk about access of care. And if you have a patient who comes to you and the doctor themselves or the health provider themselves winces or gives this sort of look of disgust, shock, will you ever go back to that health provider? Probably not. And so that's the next step that I try to do is it, it allow for um, improved access. And again, uh, you had this father who was very strong, but where else did this passion So this when I from? when I grew up in the Sudan, a lot of my cousins um, had come back from their summer vacations and had been cut and talked about it. Um, and so that was really the beginning of the thread um, that, that got me into obstetrics and gynecology, actually. Um, but really, it was it, at a very young age, I, really, I, I wanted to understand why is it that girls are treated differently? Why are girls put in a situation where they're suffering when they didn't have to be? Um, and those were the questions that came at a young age. I think I read in one of the articles uh, that someone remembers you at 10, uh, instructing some of the other girls in your class about how this was wrong at right. 10. Yeah. Um, and uh, Paul Farmer, uh, you were a student at Duke, do I remember, who was influenced by a nun in this country. Was it South Carolina? North Carolina. North Carolina. Um, well, yeah, that's, that, is, that is so, now that I think back about it a little bit. Um, I had been uh, a, a tool wannabe, although you'd have to do a time machine to make me in a tool wannabe since I'm the grandfather and he's the grandfather. <laughs> now, I, was, I was writing for student publications. I think all, all three of us did that. Um, and um, I, I, did, I, I was writing about migrant farm workers, and, I, and a lot of them were Haitian. And um, that's one thing I always say to students um, who have this idea of what they're going to do with their life. Not, not all of us were, you know, and, and Noel will, um, I, I, doesn't surprise me at all the image of her at 10 years old saying, let's get this right. I wanted to, um, I said I was going to work in West Africa. Now why? I don't know. I'd never been to West Africa. I never, and, uh, Where are you and from originally? I, what's that? Where are you from originally? Florida. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I grew up in Florida. And, uh, and I applied for a Fulbright, and I didn't even get an interview, much less the Fulbright. So Haiti was plan B. Wow. <laughs> and here I am. I just got back, you know, <laughs> 30 years later. Um, but the, back to the nun and this, and this little thread of a story, I had grown up in modest circumstances in Florida. And uh, although and there were, you know, eight of us living in a very small amount of space, um, 28 feet in fact, and I'm the smallest, I'm the shrimp of my family. So. But when I saw the conditions migrant farm workers were laboring under in the United States, and um, this was back in the late 19th century at all, when I was a little <laughs> young man. <laughs> you know, in 1981, slavery charges, well, I was a student at Duke then, 1981, I was a junior, slavery charges were brought against growers in the United States and North Carolina. This instance, and a lot of the Haitians in the migrant farm worker stream, I thought, well, I can speak French. I can talk to them. Well, I can speak French, but I couldn't talk to them because they speak another language. And it was a nun. I remember her name, Sister Juliana uh, DeWolf. And she was not only translating for me, she was working with friends of the United Farm Workers. Um, and I was just very impressed. Um, I thought, well, that's not the Catholicism I saw. You know, we're like, wake us up when mass is over, mm -hmm. you know. 
when we were kids. It's very impressive person. I met a lot of other people like that too. Yeah. So it was in this country you were inspired to do work. In this country. Took you to and that's how I ended up in Haiti as well, yeah. Plan B. And thank God for Plan B. You know, for not. <laughs> Any of you applying to college, like your son, uh, this year, just remember Plan B. Faisal, where are you? There you are. Plan B is okay too. You know, I want to ask you about that, uh, uh, more about that in a moment, but uh, Tool, uh, born in Brooklyn? Born in Brooklyn. Uh, I think your family moved to Ohio? When we were quite, when I was quite young. Where did the inspiration come from? For, I mean, you know you, we know you for so many different things. I mean, you're, some of your writing in The New Yorker, you compared the health care of two towns in Texas, so extraordinarily different. It said that President Obama took that article and said, we have to fix this. Why is one so expensive and why is one uh, so good? Um, you've, you've got your World Health Organization now. You're working on the Global Safety Challenge with them, and you have the Ariadne Labs for innovation and technology. You know, it's all of a piece. It's all global. Where, where was the inspiration? I think inspiration might be the wrong word. Confusion might be the right word. Um, the, uh, the best way I can put it is that when I met my wife, we were 18 years old, and, and she brought me home to uh, outside Washington, D.C. to meet her parents, and her mother asked me what I wanted to be when I grew up, and I said, a professional dilettante. <laughs> And all I wanted was to be able to dabble across a lot of different areas. And I feel like I've been getting away with it for the last 30 years. Um, so uh, His surgical colleagues beg to differ. He's not a dilettante. <laughs> My uh, father and mother are both doctors, grew up in a small town in Ohio. We, um, uh, at the same time, they were people who, you know, my mother helped challenge the ruling in Ohio that uh, women couldn't be members of Rotary, and she became the president of Rotary in our local town. My dad became president of the local Rotary, and, um, you know, it's this, it, Rotary doesn't sound that exciting, but it was a fundamental force that they believed they were doing good and serving the community in certain ways, and there was a great expectation that, yes, you'll become a doctor, a tool, and then you will do good in the world. And uh, my sister, who became a lawyer, <laughs> um, and had to come to her own identity of how you uh, fit the profile of what you know, good Indian parents think you need to be, found her own way of becoming someone who started her career as a union organizer, mm -hmm. and, um, and then worked her way down her own path. Um, I was always sort of head in the clouds, more theoretical. I did political science and political theory at the same time I did biology. They might have been writing about migrant workers and about um, uh, injustice. When I wrote for the Stanford Daily, I wrote uh, record reviews about and, and went to a lot of uh, music clubs and wrote about those kinds of things. Um, <laughs> the connection for me... Stanford. All, Stanford. Yeah. <laughs> the connection for me all the way along has been being interested in change and understand uh, why change seems so hard and so confusing and so conflicting even for me. Most of what I do research on or write about are problems that I don't understand and don't understand how to solve. And a lot of it is the effort to try to use, whether it's research, whether it's patient care, or it's um, writing, try to use that as a way to work through puzzles and problems and understand how to solve them. And to me, the deep connection has been feeling inspired by people like my own family and others, um, but being thrown into growing up in the poorest county in Ohio, um, going back to my father's village where he's from an extremely poor village in India, um, trying to, and, and being someone who benefited from, you know, a two-doctor family in rural Ohio, which made us some of the richest people in town. My dad drove the only Mercedes in town. Uh, was trying to understand what is living a good life, what is doing good in the world, while also satisfying intellectual, um, seemingly abstract kinds of puzzles and questions that were just interesting to me. And uh, what I think it's been, what's made it possible is, yes, those inspiring connections, but also getting to turn up in a place like this, where you meet people like these folks, you have a chief like Mike Zinner, who uh, says, you can, uh, not only you can do what you want, but you're expected to do what you want, mm -hmm. and, that, um, and that if you're not leading by making a difference, 
then you're not fulfilling the mission of this place. And so uh, the combination has been uh, rooted in a place you grow up, but then being in a place that actually constantly asks you to aim higher. Yes, mm -hmm. but how much did you say to yourself, pinch me, I can't believe no one has thought of this before, when you came up with your checklist? I remember talking to you at the time, and I, a civilian, I'm saying to you, really? You were going to put on a checklist? Do we have the right body part? You know, that, they don't have that already, that someone's checking to see, <laughs> you know, if it's the right body part? I mean, it was both, it was a little, it was scary, and it was stunning. You know, let's all wash our hands. You know, let's make sure we have the right person to operate on. I mean, how much did you say to yourself, oh my, I'm, I'm so lucky, I'm practically going to get a Nobel for this. And it's so simple. So the, the, the theme over and over and over again, because preceding that was, whether it was in the writing or, or in other areas, is that um, there is no mistake that's too dumb for us to make. And that's all my career is. <laughs> I just go, what's the dumbest mistake we could make in this cir circumstance? And we usually will make it. And over and over again, if I've failed, it's because I haven't anticipated what the next really even dumber mistake is you could make. Like, you know, can we get the website up and going? You know? Yeah. <laughs> like, um, I didn't God. think of that one. Why didn't I think that that could have happened? <laughs> and <laughs> so, the, the bottom line is that I, I'm getting away with it again. You know, the, the reason you can be a professional dilettante is you just dabble in really what, what's really dumb mistakes. Well, I have to ask you, to what do you think about the fact that the website isn't working? I mean, oh, it's infuriating and it's frustrating and it's all of those things. And yet when you peel it back, um, as it was happening, I was reading the new bio, um, history of Amazon.com. And it's the history of like you make a bookstore with a website that sells books. How hard could that be? And it's the story of failure after failure after failure, with Jeff Bezos being one step ahead of what their customer service side could actually ever do. And um, it's constantly breaking, constantly failing. And I think this is the other lesson. A website makes your ability to get healthcare incredibly simple. Unpeel what is behind that website, whether it's getting a book to you the very next day and everything from your ability to post those books to um, have it land on your doorstep, or even more important, get you health care, um, you find that it's embedded with enormous complexity. And the short story over and over and over again of delivering on health care or delivering on insurance is that we focus on the front end, invent the drug, invent the device, pass the law. And we think very, very little about how to make the front line actually work. And we are constantly surprised about how it fails at that front end. And that's what inspired me about Paul, it inspired me about my classmate, you know, Nawal, is that they were thinking beyond just make the drug, make the device, make the website, make the policy, make the law. They were asking, what is really happening to people that we're taking care of? What is really happening on the ground? And that's what I think mm. is fundamental. So every time I think, so it is frustrating and it's incredibly galling, but any of you watch the Patriots game last night? <laughs> so the, no. the other lesson here is... This That's is, a football team, this right? Is a, yeah. So they came, back, <laughs> they, they came back from being down 24-0 at halftime. You think it's completely, completely over. And the lesson of politics over and over and over again is the story is going to change in the next quarter, yeah. and in the next quarter it's going to change after that. They won 34-31. And just reminded me all over again, we are just in the first quarter of changing healthcare in America. Mm. There's another way of looking at that. The, the opposite of that, I said to someone I was interviewing a couple months ago when they were crowing about, I think it was the Republicans were back on their heels at that point. And I said, oh, but the, isn't the lesson that you never know where the anvil is coming out of the sky and it's going to, and your roadrunner is going to fall on you. Um, uh, Paul Farmer, you said you'd just come back from Haiti where I'm assuming everything is just fine, because I haven't read anything about it. Um, I want to ask all of you, and start with Paul, how much, I'm in the media, how much does global health depend upon the media deciding that a health story is one that has to be told? Well, well let me just go back to the first fragment yeah. of the question about Haiti. Yeah. 
Um, of course, I know you're, you're being ironic, uh, Robin. No, that's okay. I mean, it's um, <laughs> because there are, there is a lot of progress. I mean, uh, the people in this, and I, the people in, in this room, Gary, Betsy, um, uh, a lot of the surgeons, internists, residents, um, you know, uh, can tell you this themselves. Um, we just, we opened a beautiful teaching hospital in the middle of central Haiti. That's 200,000 square feet. It's the largest solar powered hospital in the developing world. And last month, I was down there uh, seeing, uh, doing infectious disease consults with 14 new residents, five in surgery, five in pediatrics, four in internal medicine. Those are the first Haitian residency programs in rural Haiti that I know of. So, you know, it, it's possible to say, you know, everything could never work in Haiti. That would be wrong. That's just wrong. You can get a lot. Where else could you build a 200,000 square foot hospital in less than three years, you know, three years? So I, I, I do actually have a very positive experience of, of, of working in Haiti, and yet back to the media question, and I've done this too in my own writings, which, you know, I'm, I'm sure that when I wrote uh, AIDS and Accusation, Haiti and the Geography Blame, that the president immediately took it and said, we got to fix this, <laughs> just like President Obama <laughs> taking one of your New York articles. I'm kidding. My mother was the only person who ever read it. But, <laughs> but the, the fact that, you know, you, 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 you're working on difficult yeah. subjects. I mean, whether you're looking at, you know, mucking up a, a website or some of the stories that, that a tool has told about slow spread of ideas that are, you know, let's wash our hands. You know, what, why something uh, that's difficult and uh, involves uh, death and disability. Or what Nawal sees in her clinical practice or writes about, um, you know, in, these are very difficult and weighty and, and indeed negative, painful. That's why we, we, we actually chose the title for this session ourselves, the three of us. And we struggled. We, we, we talked with friends at the beginning. We said, we're going to put suffering in the title of our talk because we all care about suffering. And the, the media, you, you're the journal, I mean, there are all forms someone needs to tell you. And it's very helpful when you have serious-minded um, communicators. I mean, a, a tool can do that directly as, you know, he, he can span those worlds. But most physicians mm. cannot do that. And so it's very important, I think. Um, it may be, uh, may be crucial um, to have journalists and, and people who can communicate effectively know about the kind of problems that we see and the kind of problems we can fix. I mean, that's the other thing. I think all three of us are, sometimes we write about the, the difficult and painful parts, but we're all commit, you know, convinced that these are problems that can be addressed and, and even rooted out. Um, so there's an optimism, I think, that's very native to our work as, as physicians. Well, it's interesting because I have been reading that in the last five years in particular, there are more and more community workers being more needed. But this idea of um, people <coughs> learning to help themselves, when you were talking about having residents in the hospital, I'm, I'm reading that in particular in the last five years, there's really been a lot of progress there. But I guess, you know, the real question behind that question was, I don't know how you do it. I mean, I don't know how you do the work that you do. Obviously, I see there's a sense of humor that helps you. But to see such global suffering and to not uh, get the attention to it until there is a tsunami. Cataclysm. Or, you know. yeah. yeah. Well, I'll just say one thing, because I know I've gone on. No. But um, the, de the declines in mortality that Rob uh, Riviello and, and Jeff Flyer and others have mentioned in, in Rwanda, in child mortality, I think Betsy talked about it too, child mortality being under five mortality, case fatality rates, that is how many people with AIDS, tuberculosis, and malaria die, and the reduction in maternal mortality, um, these are the steepest declines in hum human mortality ever documented anywhere in the world ever. Now what's not uplifting about that? to be part of something like that. Um, to see in just 10 years, you know, personally for me in Rwanda and my coworkers to see that, I mean, it is such rapid improvement. 
So yes, there are a lot of setbacks and a lot of suffering, and it's grueling. I mean, we just, you know, it's a number of us today, Larry too, we're talking about a patient, uh, you know, we lost, just lost in Rwanda, you know, with, uh, you know, an unusual malignancy, um, and just a, a very young person. And that, that part of it's grueling. But if you do this systemic thinking and take a systems approach to these problems that are almost laughable, they're so straightforward in some ways, if you take that approach, you see uh, you know, astounding uh, progress. And, and I, I guess I, I think I'm just saying that I don't believe that the modern medicine, and you can start it when you want. Like I say you start with antibiotics or the, these amazing impact of, of for example, combination chemotherapy for, uh, for AIDS or tuberculosis. We've never seen modern medicine applied in settings of great poverty with the kind of systemic um, uh, uh, understandings and the commitments and resources. We've never seen it and went in the rare little places and times where it happens, it's, an, it's astounding. You know? Well, I just I want to pick up, we were talking earlier. Do you think there's enough attention to maternal mortality? Um, so I went, wanted to think about a couple of things that you had brought up. Um, what I find interesting about the media is that attention, you know, it, it's, it's like a flash in, the, in mm -hmm. the pan, right? So the attention this month is about female genital mutilation. But oh, okay, and, and, then, and funding follows. And then attention next year is about obstetric fistula. And now everybody wants to fund obstetric fistula. Um, then the following year, it's about maternal mortality. And everybody wants to fund maternal mortality. But the issues of maternal health and child health are still persistent, and they haven't changed, much like the panel, uh, or the earlier panel, where th there was so much attention about malaria in the 1970s, and then they dropped the ball, because suddenly the funding stopped. And, I think when it comes to you know, maternal and child health, if we could sustain that interest and the funding that goes with it, then we would make changes systemically. I think what is so amazing about Rwanda is that the commitment comes from the top. You know, the Minister of Health, you know, Agnes is phenomenal when it comes to we are going to make these changes and we're going to continue focusing on these changes. Um, if we could just, you know, clone her and others to Harvard other... Harvard stem cell. Stem yeah, cell. You know, um, I think that it, you know, places in other developing countries that are suffering could really, we could see those types of changes for maternal and child health. Um, as an obstetrician, and I think a gynecologist as well, we always look at the lens with the gender-based lens. Um, so when we're looking at society, we think, well, how is that really impacting the woman or the girl? Um, and I think if more and more people looked at issues with a little more gender-based lens, I think that would help also. Yeah. Well, I want to make sure that there's time for questions, and I know there are going to be questions from the audience, so be thinking about those. We're a couple minutes away. But if each of you could just briefly do me a favor. I'm, I'm trying to get a sense of who is a global health worker. And uh, Paul, I know you've, have the, you've had this saying that's been attributed to you, that it's better to ask forgiveness than permission. I got that from the nun. From the nun. <laughs> Um, and so it seems like there has to be a healthy dose of, you know what, I'm going to poke some elbows, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, to uh, help women even though there might be people angry that I'm doing that, I'm going to po poke, you know, I'm going to sort of be aggressive. A healthy dose of that and a healthy dose of who do I need to help grease the skids to help me do the, the, the work that I need to do? Who need to, you know, how, how do I find the partners? Uh, financial, in the press, in the, in the government that you might be working with to, to help me do what I need to do. Have, have, I, have I got that right? What, what, how do each of you characterize somebody who might be, have the makings of a global health worker? So one of the things I think, um, and when I've talked to young people trying to try and decide whether they want to go into medicine, as I say that medicine, and this is true of global health too, um, is basically a way of putting off making any decisions about what you want to be when you grow up. Because you can be anything you want in it. You can be a business person, you can be a, a scientific researcher, you can be a clinician, front, clinical frontline caregiver, you can be a, um, uh, an entrepreneur, you can be a engineer, and it's totally true in global health as well. Mm -hmm. It comes in any stripe, it's just you're picking 
what your problem is. So in clinical medicine, you pick a problem of what people bring to you one on one, and, um, and you can expand it to begin to think about how you think about populations. Well, in global health, you don't even have to be a doctor to do work that asks, how do you make um, change that actually uh, reduces suffering in the world, that captures the knowledge of what exists and makes sure that everybody starts to reach that promise of being able to get it. And the short answer is that, uh, that the three of us are very different brands of this. You know, I'm kind of the ideas person. I don't travel nearly as much as these guys do. I'm going to Kigali tonight. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> and, and I think I would um, suffocate on all the airplane air that you have had to live with, Paul. And, um, and the, the sense of rootedness for me very much here at home in America while wanting to be someone who can help make possible changes that are in many countries in the projects we work on Ariadne Lab has become about a way of uh, figuring out how to extend myself, how to influence through ideas, influence through discovery, influence, influence through partnerships and others that, that make that go. Each would have their own version of what that turns out to be and we've been all helped by many people we see in this room who've been their own brand of a global health worker, whether it's on the front line as someone thinking about how you scale up what happens at the front line, manage projects, run, um, uh, uh, create new ideas, run whole programs, do a variety of things. So there is no one way. I think the hard part for being a global health worker, the big difference from being someone who goes into clinical medicine is that in clinical medicine there's a track. You know what to do when you're a freshman in college and a first year medical student and a resident and then an attending and then a chief and then a, et cetera. In global health work, this is, um, you know, you look to people like grandpa here <laughs> because they're your only path that you know there is. And then, you know, if you're doing it right, you're making an entirely new path hmm. and you're making one that works for yourself. So at least that's my version of the global health worker is that right now there are a few tracks that are coming into existence. But, the, um, but much of the career path is not laid out at all. Yeah. I mean, my, uh, my thought about sort of the work that I do and also global health workers is that I'm much more in the trenches. I'm, you know, my partners are almost the invisible people because in order for, for me to bring about social change, I need to change people's minds on all the layers. What happened with female genital cutting is in the past, the British came to, for instance, Sudan and said, oh, this is a barbaric, you know, this is so barbaric, this is horrific, we need to change this, is how can you Africans do this to your daughters? And in fact, what happened was that people held on to this practice even strongly, you know, more strongly. And the best way to change behavior is not to antagonize or confront, but to talk. And that will take, I would imagine that would take a lot of patience. It takes a lot of patience, yeah. it takes a lot of time. And so, you know, I'm sort of more of the mole underground trying to just change and hopefully at some point, the, you know, the ground falls through and there's a beautiful garden. Um, and, um, but when it comes to global health workers, I, I think that Anybody be, can be a global health worker, and I, a very good example is I worked in Addis Ababa uh, in a fistula hospital, and one of the surgeons who taught me how to repair fis uh, vesicovaginal fistulas was somebody who her, she herself had a fistula, and um, in time she didn't want to go back to her village after she had been repaired, but started assisting the surgeons, and sure enough, after a little while she was repairing the simple fistula and the more complex fistula, and then she was running the operating room. And so I think in a way, anyone can be the global health worker. You don't have to have a particular path. You can fall into it at any time. Paul. Well, you know, I, I just have to, well, as, as if we were at the Brigham seeing a consult, the, the um, trainee does all the work, writes a note, and then the, the attending comes in and writes, agree, agree with, with above. above. <laughs> I agree with above and agree with above. Um, and so I would just add, you know, the, and again, this is, is a little bit, seems gratuitous, which is an interesting word also. The nun thought gratuity was good. <laughs> um, is that community health workers are so absent from the discussion in some countries, you know, Russia, the United States, the developed countries, they, you know, they're, they're, they need to be our partners. 
patients and their families need to be our partners. And again, I, when I say gratuitous, it's important, you know, because this is not a, an audience. I mean, probably on Thursday or Friday, I will be around community health workers and, and patients. But again, I have to say, I think anybody can be a global health mm -hmm. worker. I mean, I'm looking around the room, I see Lois White. I mean, for 30 years, she's been supporting, you know, our work with Partners in Health. Um, or Bud Rose, who's giving us up to date, you know, uh, in, in the hospitals where we work in Haiti or Rwanda. Um, and again, you've heard about the leaders of the, of the hospital system and the medical school. Really, they're global health workers. One of my colleagues from Harvard Medical said, at, at medical school said after Jeff Flyer was talking, Jeff is propagating the message of our department very well. That's what I've, he's, he works for me, oh. Jeff Flyer does. <laughs> I thought it was funny too, but you know, <laughs> um, I was picturing. Yeah. But um, and then I see around. I, I see you know un unlikely partners, you know, um, like Michael Murphy and others, the architects who helped us design mm -hmm. and uh, continue to help global health experts, who people think of as physicians, help us design hospitals so that they're safer and they're 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 better than than anything that uh, came before. We don't know how to do that. We need them to be global health workers. Or a surgical resident, uh, you know, Kashif Khan, who's sitting right here, who 10 years ago, also a Brown student, was a Partners in Health intern and is now a surgeon at the program. And it, and, and it goes on and on. Dan and, and, and Robert already spoke together about their partnership in Rwanda. I, Barbara Beer, helping us get this, you know, enormous project, Human Resources for Health, off the ground in Rwanda, unprecedented. So I, I have to say, as, as straightforward as it sounds or almost like a platitude. Anybody can be a global health worker, but I think everybody should be a global mm -hmm. health worker. I think it is, uh, you know, you put it beautifully. It's the, the, this is the standard by which we'll judge the success of our societies. You know, how well do we do by people who are suffering and, you know, marginalized by poverty, gender inequality, et cetera. And, and so I, I really think we all need to be global health workers. Paul Farmer, Atul Gawande, Nawal Noor, um, thank you so much. Let's get your questions in. I think there's a microphone there, and there's a microphone there, and we'll take a, a couple, and um, that will be that. Who Any questions? First? <laughs> Up, they're making their way. Up. Someone is making either that or exiting. <laughs> I can't tell. <laughs> yes, making her way. Yes, right there. Hi, thank you very much. My name is Asiatu. I'm a research assistant in the Department of Global Health and Social Medicine. Um, and first, before I start my question, I know it was said in passing, but if you do figure out the stem cell copy, we'd like a copy too. I'm from Guinea. Um, we'll take a copy of the honorable minister any day. Um, She's awesome. <laughs> I, Agnes Benaguaho, this is her. the most important figure in my, in my view in global health today and the Minister of Health of Rwanda. Yeah. Thank you for, for saying it again. Um, so I am a big fan of all of your work and so excuse me if my voice is shaking a little bit. Um, I understand the importance of, and significance of recognizing or being able to connect a small um, in, in an inpatient interaction um, problems that may arise then with larger structures. I'm wondering how um, do you then turn that into a teachable moment at all, if at possible, for the people that you're helping as well. So um, as an example, I am part of a team of uh, researchers doing a study on FGC among West Africans in New York. We had a focus group a couple of weeks ago with um, women under 30 and over 30. Um, they shared great insights, had um, really powerful stories and ask really important questions. But in the role of the researcher, how then do you turn that into a moment of helping them connect to the larger structures that may impact some of the things that they're feeling and experiencing? Is that even our role um, as researchers or as um, pay, uh, care providers for those clinicians in the room? And how have you done that in your work? And I just love some insights being young <laughs> in this research career. How can you turn those moments into teachable moments as well, if possible? So I'm, I'm not somebody who's big on labels. So I would say, take your label away from you. And you're, you're a person talking to another person. You're, 
you're a woman talking to another woman. So you're not only a research assistant. You're somebody who can actually sympathize, relate, have a conversation with that individual, the group, the focus, the focus study um, group as well. And um, you know, I find that humor is a good way of educating. So I do spend a lot of time, you know, making jokes about how, how, do, how does one make a joke about female genital mutilation, right? But I do. There is a lot. There's many things you can say about it, but we won't go there now. Um, but I use humor as a method of, of uh, educating girls and women. Um, and then I take that opportunity to ask them to, if you find that you've been able to either understand their concept and that they want to change the practice, mm -hmm. that it's time for them to spread the word. Mm -hmm. um, and it is their job to tell their sister, mother, friend, cousin back home that what they learned that day. Mm -hmm. um, and that's how, when I talk about being a mole underground, that's, the, that's one of the best ways of having a, a method of communication. But really, more than anything, you're not just a research assistant. You're somebody who's you know, a woman who is going to be able to change the world and do global health. And I think that's about all the time we're going to have for questions. I didn't leave enough time. So we'll bring Betsy back. Thank you again. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. so many story ideas. Thank you so much, Robin. This has been an absolutely remarkable afternoon. We have had, heard such personal, dramatic, and inspiring personal stories. We've heard about writing about the dumbest mistakes we can make. We've heard about being a mole who works underground, the ground caving in, and a beautiful garden erupting. And we've heard about Grandpa, who agrees with above and agrees with above. But importantly, we've heard about how each of us in this room can and are be a uh, global health worker, how we each uh, can make a difference. It all starts with our passion. Uh, it starts with what comes from the heart. And I want to thank each of the panelists who are here today who shared their passion and shared what comes from their heart uh, with us. And we will continue that communication and that sharing uh, in the atrium uh, afterwards. I also want to thank those who worked tirelessly behind the scenes to make this all happen. Thank you again for being here. <laughs>